when I wrote you and said, we will be doing this thing tonight, this investigation, I didn't know much about mediocrity, but I immediately took to the Google and I've discovered some very important things, beginning with uh, the appearances of the word itself. So <clears throat> this is over the last 500 years, appearances in literature of the word mediocrity. <laughs> And it's actually kind of fascinating. It used to be a medical term beginning in the 1400s. The baby was gestated at the mediocrity of the woman's body. And then a strange thing happened in 1589. There was a man by the name of Thomas Nash, who was a, a famous British pamphleteer, which was a thing. And he wrote one day in one of his pamphlets, either the lovers of mediocrity are very many, or the number of good poets is very small. And it was very interesting that he started to focus on a mediocrity or a mushy middle and qualifying it as bad in 1589 because the 1580s were fucking crazy. In another lecture, if you've seen others, I talk about in 1582, Pope Gregory XIII catching a discrepancy in Caesar's calendar, the Julian calendar. The rotation of the earth had not been quite a year in the Julian calendar, and over the course of 1,500 years, it had led to a discrepancy of 11 days. And so Pope Gregory XIII and his math guys figured out that the only solution is to issue an edict to all Catholic countries, Portugal, Spain, Italy, France, that October 4th, 1582 would be followed by October 15th, 1582. And... All the, so all the Catholic countries have switched uh, their calendar, but the, but the Protestant countries like England and Germany stuck with the Julian calendar. And so then in the 1580s, starting seven years before the invention of the word mediocrity, it was a different day in the calendar in different countries in Europe. And so therefore, it was either 11 days ago or now. There was no mushy middle in between. You were on the bus or off the bus. And so therefore, this Thomas Nash character alighted upon this binary thinking and put it into his pamphlet. And William Shakespeare, who was probably the greatest writer in the English language, coincidentally decided to write plays at the exact same time as this pamphlet came out. In 1589, he began writing his first play. And Shakespeare, when you study how to act it, is all about antitheses. You are either this or you are that. And in the Shakespeare, when you are acting it, you are told to change with the changes. For instance, in his big ones, to be and the actor is informed to embody all that is true about being and being alive when he says the word be and that poetry rips through his body or not to be. And then the actor has to change their tone completely to the darkness, to death, to everything, to just not being. And so Shakespeare wrote uh, many plays and in all of them, you watch these antitheses and the way the language bounces back and forth and these words bounce off of each other all because in Europe at the time, you were, you know, on the bus or off the bus. So now, is there evidence that Shakespeare read Thomas Nash's pamphlet? As a matter of fact, with uh, some creative uh, Wikipedia-ing, I happened to discover that Thomas Nash also wrote erotica about the Earl of Southampton. <laughs> and the Earl of Southampton was Shakespeare's patron. He paid for all of uh, Shakespeare, he paid for Shakespeare's salary, basically. And I don't know about you guys, but if someone were writing erotic fan fiction about my boss, <laughs> I'd read the shit out of it, and then I would Google every other pamphlet that guy had written. <laughs> and, <laughs> South, and the Earl of Southampton was indeed a man about town and uh, had an unquenchable sexual appetite, as symbolized visually by this cat in this, uh, in this <laughs> painting. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the beginning, the birth of the word mediocrity. And why is it important? Blaise Pascal said, nothing is as approved as mediocrity. The majority has established it and it fixes its fangs on whatever it gets beyond it either way. Albert Einstein said, mediocre minds ordinarily condemn everything that is beyond their range. Children's book author Ursula Nordstrom warned in 1953 of a dangerous combination in media culture of the influential and the unimaginative. And this got me thinking. There is indeed the imagination versus influence conundrum. So if we were to put imagination on the x-axis 
and influence on the y-axis. And then have a look at the trajectory of certain careers. You'll see a very interesting thing. We start off with the born artist who starts off and he has uh, an early triumph, but then discovers substances and finally uh, non-art things take over and he dies in obscurity. But then there's the auteur director. Surely they must do well. They start off, they get a video camera in high school and uh, show a lot of promise. They head off to film school and their thesis blows people's minds. Then uh, they have a Sundance darling, a prestige picture, but then they signal their decline by making a movie about making movies, fart out a post-divorce turd, start quoting themselves, and eventually they're dead inside. But what about somebody who goes directly for the influence and tries to climb to power? They do well at first. They are, uh, they're plucked from the mailroom. And then whoop, a younger version of them shows them up, so they stick with what they know. But then they have a midlife crisis, turn things around. They quit to write full time. And they join the born artists and then die in obscurity. So that's very sad. But then, then there are some who just have charmed lives and climb straight to the top without incident. They do well, they get promotion after promotion, nothing goes wrong, and uh, they're very happy in their marriage. But um, are they replicants? Just a thought. Then sometimes, very occasionally, someone comes along that has the perfect combination of imagination and influence. They do really well, they're just the next big thing, and sadly, they OD, uh, because that's always how it happens. So there's really, there's this force field keeping people from true glory, which is up in the upper right-hand corner. But you can get there, but it is only posthumously. If you stick to what you know. Mediocrity is this thing that kind of like sucks people towards it. This is the Sarlacc pit from The Return of the Jedi. And it reminds me of what mediocrity is like in our society. As it's sort of like you try as an artist to get beyond, get outside of things, do things in an imaginative way that makes sense, but, the, but mediocrity will always suck you back for various psychological reasons. Here, Lando Calrissian is like, I think I'm gonna make a horror movie, and Han Solo's like, don't go genre, do something interesting. And then Lando is like, no, I wanna be successful. <laughs> And it's very sad, and then he makes kind of a run-of-the-mill horror movie. It's, it's, it's all very sad. And by the way, I was nine years old when I saw this shot. Uh, and that Oscar is alive at all is a miracle.